Hey friends, welcome back to the Dwelling Place podcast. We are so glad that you are joining us today and we hope you're encouraged and inspired as you listen to this week's message. Matthew 5 verses 1 to 12. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You can take your seat this morning. We've been going through a series we've entitled entitled L-Y-B-L, Live Your Best Life or Live Your Blessed Life. Um, And it's this series all around the Beatitudes, this series of statements that Jesus makes about who would be regarded as the blessed ones in the kingdom of God. You know, he uses this word blessed, this idea of being happy, to be satisfied, to be secure, to be full of joy. Blessed is to be living your best life. And in Jesus' time, much as it is today, um, the idea of blessed, blessed was associated with the rich, the powerful, um, those who had influence, those who were good looking, those who um, had power at their disposal, those who had it all. Um, And so the thing is, Jesus, Jesus approaches it very differently with the Beatitudes. He says it's not the good looking, not the intelligent, not those that have plenty. The world says you're blessed based on what you have. The the religious elite of the day believed that you were blessed because of what you do. Jesus takes this a step further and he cuts straight to the heart. And so we started this series a few weeks ago with the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize their spiritual bankruptcy. Blessed are those who recognize that, that they are lacking spiritually in the need of God. We then moved on to blessed are those who mourn, not only just over the external things that are happening in the world around them, but blessed are those who mourn over their internal state, who, who recognize not only their spiritual bankruptcy, but they, they mourn over it, they repent over it, they bring it to God, and through that, they're comforted. And then on Sunday, we, we looked at blessed are those, uh, blessed are the meek. We looked at how meek is not weak, but in fact, it's great power under control. It's the strength of character to yield to God. And so if you zoom out for a moment, and we've obviously, we've been taking these one at a time, but if you zoom out for a moment, you begin to realize this beautiful progression here in the words of Jesus. The blessing is for those that recognize that we're poor in spirit, that we're in need of a savior, that we need God and we mourn over it. We repent and we come to God and allow his comfort to come to us. And then in meekness, we hand him the reins of our our lives. We give him the control. Instead of trying to take power and, and, and take things by force, we actually, we give over control to God. We hand him control and we yield to him. And it's from this place of surrender that Jesus goes on to the next beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I want to start by asking, what does Jesus actually mean when he talks about righteousness? I think righteousness can um, sound like a very Christian word. Yeah, I would say it is quite a Christianese term. I think often we can associate it with ticking off all the Christian boxes. I'm righteous if I don't murder anyone, don't steal. Like if I've got those big ones covered, I'm doing pretty well on the righteousness scale. Um, And then I can take my righteousness even further if I turn up to church, Um, if I pray, if I read my Bible. Now, there is nothing wrong with any of those things. In fact, all of those things are good but that's not the fullness of what Jesus speaks of when he says righteousness. He's not merely referring to this superficial um, compliance to, to religious rules or moral standards. He's speaking about something so much more important. The Greek word that's translated righteousness, it's this word dikaiosune. 
and it's used 347 times throughout the Bible. I don't know about you, but when I was in school or in university, um, some of you who are in school or university would know this, and if you don't know it, take note. If your teacher or your lecturer says something a few times, it's a good um, idea to start taking notes. That's probably the time where you go, oh, okay, they've now mentioned that four, five times. I probably need to tune in here. I need to focus. I need to take some notes because that, that's going to be on the test. And so even more so, I think when we realize that God would spend more than 300 occasions in the Bible talking about something, hey, hold on, maybe we need to stop for a moment. Maybe we need to focus in and look at what he's saying. The word righteousness refers to two key things throughout scripture. First, righteousness is being made right with God. And then second, it's doing right by God. It's being made right with God and then doing right by God. Being made right with God is the righteousness that we have because of Jesus. It's the reason we gather today. It's the story of Easter. Romans 3, 21 to 26. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. The, this righteousness is given through, the, through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. We can't earn it. This was a gift that was freely given to us. We receive it when we accept Jesus as our saviour. It's this beautiful exchange on the cross, he took our sin and in return, he gave us righteousness. Jesus says, it's good. It's blessed when you realize that you're in need of God. It's, it's blessed when you realize that you can't be righteous on your own, but you are in need of him. It's good when we have an appetite for the things of God, to desire to know God more and more. True righteousness begins with a personal encounter with Jesus a moment of surrender where we acknowledge our need for him and a need for his saving grace. But righteous, righteousness isn't just about head knowledge. It's not just about being religiously correct. Um, it's about heart transformation. It goes deeper than just knowing that we need a savior. Jesus was preaching um, the Sermon on the Mount to, to Jewish people who would have thought that righteousness was attainable to the religious elite, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, um, they're the ones that could be righteous. And so, um, you know, the Pharisees, they, they went through rigorous training. They had to memorize scripture after scripture. They had to abide by law, hundreds of laws. And so I can only imagine that when Jesus says, blessed are um, you who hunger and thirst after righteousness, um, the audience is like, okay, like I know who's righteous. That's the Pharisees. They're the righteous ones. The, the religious elites, they're the, they're the pinnacle of human righteousness. But then Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. Jesus would have shocked his audience in this moment. How could our righteousness surpass that of those who, that's, that's their whole life. That's their whole job. When it came to Bible knowledge, the Pharisees had more than anybody else, but their righteousness came from outward appearance, not from a transformation of the heart. They were seen as righteousness because of their knowledge and their image, but they'd not experienced a tra transformed lives. And as Jesus put it in Matthew 23, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but, in, oh, sorry, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus challenges the prevailing notions of righteousness held by the religious elite of the day. He emphasizes the importance of sincerity in their pursuit of God over their outward appearance. 1 Samuel 16 says, the Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God, the Lord looks at the heart. For, for us, this means that, that righteousness is not merely about following a set of rules or performing um, religious duties. It's about allowing God to renew our hearts from the inside out. Righteousness is first about being in right standing with God and then allowing that to transform us, renew us, make us new. And, and the other part of righteousness is doing right by God, living his way. 
pursuing his ways, living the kind of life that pleases God. It's, it's a life that becomes like a living example of Jesus in the earth. Righteousness includes this endeavor to, to line up our lives with the will of God. It involves pursuing a life characterized by obedience to God and his commands and a desire to reflect his holiness that comes out of the personal relationship with God. It's, allow, it's about longing for deeper intimacy with him and then attempting to embody Jesus in the world. 1 Peter 1 verse 15 and 16 but just as he who called you as holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is re- written, be holy because I'm holy. And so righteousness, it's, it's first being in right standing with God. And second, it's living right for God. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't say you're blessed because you're righteous. That, that beatitude, it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. It doesn't say the righteousness is blessed. It says the righteousness is the blessing. What's blessed is the hunger. You, you Read that again, ready? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Righteousness is the blessing. Hunger is the condition. And so throughout the Bible, hunger and thirst, they, they're used as these vivid metaphors um, for this deep longing, this deep desire for the things of God. Psalm 42, the psalmist writes, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. The, the Greek word used for hunger isn't merely about lack. When we're hungry, we're lacking in, in sustenance. But the, the Greek word here for hunger isn't just about lack. It's lack partnered with want. It's, it, it implies a fervent craving. It's a seeking with eager desire. The people Jesus was talking to understood what it meant to be physically hungry. The, the place and time that Jesus is speaking, that not everyone um, would have had food on a daily basis. They didn't have, you know, Woolworths across the road like I do. They didn't have refrigerators and running water. Many lived in poverty. And so they, they were well acquainted with the pains of hunger. I mean, honestly, most of us, I, would, I could take a guess that the vast majority of, of us, if not all of us, have never really experienced true hunger. I mean, the extent of our hunger probably goes to when you rock up to the KFC drive through window and they say, hey, can you park around the front? Um, that We have no chicken. It's going to be another 10 minutes for your meal. I mean, why does KFC never have chicken? They have one job. Um, but th- that's probably the extent, honestly, of, of what we think of when we think of hunger. My belly is rumbling. I'm sitting in that car at the front of KFC. Why can't they do their job? Why can't they bring me my chicken? I'm starving. This is a little bit melodramatic. But that's the, that, that's the extent of the physical hunger that many of us have experienced. But the people that Jesus is speaking to, they were well acquainted with hunger. And, and it's, it's this that, that Jesus says, hey, these people, sorry, it's to these people that Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger, who fervently crave, who seek with desire. If you're truly hungry, you seek with desire sustenance. If you're truly hunger, hungering, there's nothing that's going to stop you from finding the sustenance that you need. In essence, Jesus is calling us to examine our spiritual appetites. What's your hunger like this morning? To assess where, what are we craving? What are we pursuing? Are we seeking after the things of God? Or are we indulging in, in empty, fleeting spiritual calories? Fleeting pleasures that, that leave us unfulfilled? In our, in our world today, it's really easy to, to fall into the trap of thinking that fulfillment will come with the next promotion or um, the right relationship or, you know, a bigger bank, bank account or a better house or whatever it might be. We, we go around hoping that these things will satisfy this deep longing that we have inside of us. But Isaiah 55 verse 2, it says, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah 2, sorry, says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have, dung, have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. This is, this is the experience of many of us. We create our own containers for, for joy, for peace, for happiness, to, to try and find blessing. We, we search in the wrong containers. We go around, hey, if I can just get a bigger salary, but who knows, that salary drains out, the happiness drains out. 
We, we think if I can just have a better relationship. But the, this is the thing. The, those are broken cisterns, as Jeremiah says. They can't hold living water. Who knows junk food leaves us craving more. It leaves us feeling unsatisfied. But not only that, it leaves us feeling sluggish. It leaves us sick. Probably gives you a little bit of heartburn. Then the true is the same is true in our spiritual life. Filling ourselves with spiritual junk food leads to emptiness. Chasing after a salary or chasing after status or sex or prominence or prestige or promotion, whatever it might be, it might give you a quick rush. You might get the sugar hit that you were looking for, but it will leave you ultimately unfulfilled, sluggish, probably a bit of heartburn. But even in our, the thing is, in, in our restlessness, in our longing, we all have this deep desire for something. Jesus offers us a different path, a path that leads to true fulfillment and satisfaction. John 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He invites us to come to him, the source of living water, the bread of life. Here's the thing though, the hungering and the thirsting for righteousness, it's not a one-time deal. It's not a hunger and thirst one-off and, and you're satisfied forever without constant pursuit. You see, Jesus says who hunger and thirst. It's not who hungered and thirst. Did. Sorry, excuse my grandma, grandma. I'm trying to give a grammar lesson here and I've got no clue. No, um, but this is the thing. You look at what Jesus says grammatically. He's talking about an ongoing action. Those who are filled are not those who have their hunger and thirst met once and for all, but those who are continually hungering and thirsting. It's this re relentless pursuit, a constant yearning to live a life of righteousness, to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. And so what does it mean to be hungry in a spiritual sense? It means recognizing that insatiable longing within us, a longing that can only be satisfied by drawing near to God. It means rejecting the empty promises of the world, reject the spiritual junk food, and turn our hearts towards the, the truths of his word. It means embracing a life of continual pursuit, a journey of seeking his righteousness. And what does Jesus say? He says, when we do this, when we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we'll be filled. We'll be filled. We'll be satisfied. Satisfaction can so often um, seem like this elusive dream. You know, we're, we're bombarded with ads daily. Um, the recent statistics say that the average person actually sees around 10,000 ads per day. That's a lot of ads. And a whole lot of these are promising satisfaction guaranteed. But who knows, the satisfaction doesn't last and they come out with a Brett, you know, the iPhone, satisfaction guaranteed. But the next year, here's a new iPhone because the last one didn't satisfy. And this is the thing with our world. They keep trying to one up, one up because they leave us longing and craving more. We're trying to fill a void with these things that don't last. It might be nice for a moment, but it doesn't last. You know, throughout history, people have sought satisfaction in all sorts of ways, whether it's through material possessions, whether it's through accomplishments, through, through relationships. Yet time and time again, we find ourselves not satisfied. Is it the Rolling Stones that, you know, had that, that anthem, can't get no satisfaction you know that's that's almost like this longing desire within our hearts despite our best efforts we struggle to fill the void and it leaves us restless and discontent c.s lewis once said if i find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that i was made for another world jesus invites us into a different world one where true satisfaction is found in seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. He assures us that when we do this, when we seek him, all the other things of life fall into place. Matthew 6 verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. It's not about chasing after worldly pleasures and accumulating wealth and status. It's about pursuing a deeper intimacy with God, a hunger and thirst that he promises to satisfy. How's your appetite this morning? What are you hungry for? Are you hungry for the things of God? 
Thanks for spending time with us today. To hang out again the next time an episode drops, make sure you subscribe. See ya!